Good morning and welcome to the workshop on genetic uh, variant analysis. Uh, in this workshop, we will be learning how we can characterize our variants, which we get after alignment, uh, uh, whether through whole genome sequencing or whole exome sequencing or targeted gene panel. So irrespective of the pipeline uh, for the upstream analysis we use, uh, at the end we get the variant call file, that is the VCF file. So in VCF file, we will be having many variants, not many, we will be having millions of variants, 1000, 10,000 of variants, which we get. So how to interpret those variants, which will be uh, important, which will not be important to our patient, because every individual is different and how to correlate our phenotypes patient or the individual phenotypes with the genotype. So that is the aim of this particular workshop. Uh, so feel free, free to ask any question anytime. You can unmute yourself and ask question or you can put your question in the chat box. The objective of this workshop is the overview of the current framework for analysis and interpretation of sequence variants for monogenic disorder. This particular framework will not implement in uh, uh, the disorders which do not follow the Mendelian disorder or the multiple factors are involved apart from the genes, multiple genes or the environmental together or any other factor. The overview of the key available resources and their utility with the variant interpretation. So in this workshop, we will be looking at different databases. We will be learning all those databases and how to use those databases for variant interpretation. So uh, uh, this is the workflow for the variant interpretation annotation. Uh, then we have to look uh, those variants as per the ACMG guidelines. So we will be looking at what are the, those guidelines and then variant interpretation. So few things are not the scope of this particular uh, workshop, but uh, I will just uh, start from the beginning how the process starts and how to reach to this VCF file. Because to get the VCF file, the pre-processing is also equally important so that we ensure that what the VCF we get, it is a proper and the correct VCF for the downstream or the variant interpretation. So because the NGS, uh, so it has a lot of application of NGS platform and NGS uh, is a different, plat uh, it has a different platforms uh, also using different chemistries. So you can use any chemistry, any platform, but in clinical setting, uh, most of the labs, they follow Illumina platform. So as per Illumina platform, so first is the sample preparation. So whatever the sample you want to process for whole genome, whole exome or targeted capture, uh, you have to isolate your DNA. So the starting material is the DNA. So you have to identify the source from where you are going to isolate your DNA. It could be either blood in case of um, genomic variants uh, or in case of cancer samples, it could be a FFP tissue or a fresh tissue or a blood, at, uh, blood also if you want to map somatic or the genomic variant uh, together. So after uh, we isolate the DNA, first we need to ensure the DNA quality. So after, once we ensure the DNA quality is good, then the next step is the library preparation. So once lab, uh, in the library preparation, there are multiple steps. Just to summarize the steps, uh, it starts from the fragmentation, uh, then the adapter ligation, then barcoding, and then the if it is a exome or targeted a targeted gene panel, the capture uh, step is involved in while in whole genome sequencing, capture step is not involved. So once the libraries are ready, uh, then the uh, pooling will be happen between the samples and they go for the sequencing. So once that sequencing data is out, the sequencing data is in the form of a uh, FASTQ files that is the raw data. So again, every step is important because it's a lengthy process, it's very crucial process, it's very sensitive and costly process. So every step involves the QC. 
So once we have the raw data, we need to do the QC of the raw data. So there are different parameters on which the tools will uh, evaluate your data, whether the data is good or not. So basically our aim is to see whether the data quality, the base quality, which is called from the platform, it is good. That is the quality score, which we target in the exome because it is related to clinical aspect and uh, the treatment management of the patient depends on this data and the interpretation. So usually the quality score is set as uh, greater than or equal to 30. So when we will, uh, uh, I will uh, show you something uh, which uh, you will get uh, to understand how the quality of the data looks like and uh, what needs to be done. Uh, but uh, those steps are not in very detail, but uh, I will give you a glimpse of those steps as well. When we will look at the data and the data parameters. Uh, yeah. Also, when we look at the data, we need to ensure that the data is coming only from one genome or the single individual genome, not from the multiple genome. Excuse uh, me. Yes. Ma'am, uh, if we use uh, Iron Torrent Thermo Fisher platform, uh, uh, all the uh, workflow is the same or different? Uh, so it is the same because Iron Torrent will also give you fast queue files, right? Okay. So the starting point is the fast queue files. Fast queue files, okay. Yes, if any platform is not giving the fast queue files, so then uh, there are processes which you can convert your raw data into fast queue files. And then from fast queue files, the uh, analysis is same. Okay, got it. Uh, but uh, these are uh, like uh, free tools and other things, though there are uh, softwares which are um, provided by the company also. Um, so you can, it is, depends on you. And Iron Torrent, uh, they provide their own software. Uh, that is my understanding. So you can use their software or you can use uh, some free software as well. Uh, in combination. Okay. Okay. So till VCF, the process is same. After VCF, you can adopt many other processes also. Even till you get the VCF, there are many pipelines available. You can adopt anything. But in clinical setting, most of the labs, uh, they adopt GATK pipeline for variant calling or the bias uh, calling. Uh, these are the two main important uh, pipelines, but people use Variscan also. If uh, it is uh, somatic and germline, they use a uh, very scan also for the variant calling. Uh, some people they use BCF tools. It depends how you validate in your system. Okay, because our main focus is uh, NIPT samples, ma'am. Uh, NIPT pipeline is different. But yes, once you get the variants, the interpretation remains the same. Thank you, ma'am. You can mm. go ahead, ma'am. Yeah. So uh, once we have the raw data fast queue files, uh, the first step is the base calling. And because uh, the platform generates the data in terms of image, uh, that image is converted into a text or the sequence format. Uh, the, so that process is called as base calling. After base calling is done, the raw data quality is being performed and the tool will evaluate your data on different parameters. So like it will tell you about your data, what is the read length, uh, how the data quality score is, because every base has its own quality score, whether the base is called accurately or not from the images. So that quality is very, very important so that it will give you a confidence score that yes, the base is called is being correct. So once it is done, uh, then the, uh, as I mentioned, it evaluates your data on different parameters. That parameters also we will look. What are those parameters? So once the QC is being done, the first step is the read alignment. Uh, so basically the uh, variant interpretation and uh, correlation with the phenotypes we usually generally use in case of humans. And most of the time it is in the clinical settings. Though it is for uh, research also, but most of the time it is for the patient care. So it is very, very important uh, to take care of all these parameters. And when we set the parameters, they need to be very, very stringent. So once the read alignment is being done, uh, then we have to uh, look at the read, uh, alignment quality. What is the alignment percentage? And we have a human reference genome. So the read data will be aligned to a reference genome. 
and make sure that uh, uh, whenever you are using the reference genome or the annotation files, uh, they need to be updated and with the current version. Don't use um, the older versions. So once the alignment is done, again, we have to do some QC parameters to make ensure that the alignment is good. Uh, and then there are some small, small um, steps in between, like duplicate removals, uh, duplicate markings, uh, the quality, uh, and uh, how many reads are aligned to each chromosome. So such kind of QC parameters is being performed. And then from that alignment, the variant calling is performed. So I will show you, uh, not in detail, but I will show you what all uh, consolidated, what are the steps which you can follow. So once we call for the variants, irrespective of the uh, tool or the uh, package you use for the variant calling, ultimately we get the VCF file. So in this VCF file, this is the VCF file format and it has a header. It will have uh, uh, so much of information in this VCF file. So usually the VCF file will have uh, uh, these columns. Uh, so first is the chromosome, then the position, the ID of those uh, uh, positions, the reference base, altered base, the quality of the base which you set. So as I mentioned, usually we set at quality score 30, but as uh, uh, greater than uh, the quality score will be, it will be good. The filter, what the parameters to call for the variants we set, uh, then the, uh, whether the filter is being passed or not, that will be mentioned in this column. Information column, then the uh, format column, and then the result. So on the top, you can see the sample name. So uh, you can uh, give this column as a sample name. You can set this parameter. And then based on this, you can merge many samples together. So like if you want to evaluate the proband, mother, father, or a same family samples together and see uh, which one has uh, what, which kind of variant, and then you can merge all these VCF files together. So uh, the first step is the annotation of this VCF. So what is missing in this VCF? We do not know what these positions are, what in which gene they are, because we have just mentioned the chromosome one. So the first step for this VCF is the annotation. So this is the unannotated VCF. First step is the annotation. Also, you can see in the format column, there are some annotations like GT, AD, ADP, or the, uh, there are these parameters what they stand for all these is mentioned in the header. So there will be some information column here. It is not showing, but when you will look at the information column in the real VCF, there will be some information here also. So what these uh, notation stands for all these uh, are mentioned in the header. So you can go through these headers to understand what these stands for. So like GT is for the uh, genotype, GQ is for the genotype quality. So all these, uh, uh, everything is mentioned over here. We will look when we will look at the VCF itself. Ma'am, uh, in this okay. file, uh, uh, the example of which sample? What I will show this uh, VCF. Part. So uh, whether you get any VCF, whether it is a genetic disorder, whether it is from NIPT, whether it is for your cancer sample, all the VCF files looks like same. Uh, that I understood, but uh, in mm -hmm. this example, uh, which sample you have used? Uh, this is, a, I just took it for the Google, but when we will look at the VCA, we will be having from the primary immunodeficiency uh, data. So simultaneously, if you have, you can look at your VCF and then, uh, you know, try to analyze that. But uh, when you are trying to analyze your sample, you, you should have the complete patient uh, history and the family history. That is very, very important. So phenotypes are important when you go and interpret your VCF. Okay. Because you should, uh, because see again, uh, when you are uh, using the filter uh, um, for your disease, so you should understand the disease and already known genes which are associated for that disease. So, because first go, you have to evaluate those genes which are associated with those diseases, with that disease. Okay. So, I will show you how you can uh, uh, take the gene list for your phenotypes. So, first thing, thing as mentioned that it is the annotation. 
there are different annotation tools you can use. So those tools either you can install in your local system or you can use as a web server. So uh, there are different parameters on which the annotation will be performed. So we will see uh, in the upcoming slides what are those parameters. So it will show you what genes they are associated with, uh, what mutation type and their location and in silico prediction. So these all these steps are categorized basically into three steps and uh, the population allele frequency. So if you will see, sorry. Uh, so uh, once we get the VCF file, so our uh, aim is to have the variant annotation, variant filtering and the variant prioritization from the annotated VCF file. So filter the variants which are having uh, nothing. So uh, as I mentioned, we have the depth, DP means depth of the variants and the quality score. I just put the minimal uh, parameters, but this will be very stringent when it comes to the clinical setting. So DP means depth of the reads. So the depth means how many reads are aligned, which have the variation. So it should be greater than 10. In any of the case, it should not be lesser than 10. Because when you put for the whole genome, uh, it is a it is sequenced at thirty x, so DP should be uh, DP should be greater than ten. In case of uh, exome or the targeted gene panel, you can set it at a uh, thirty or hundred, because uh, those uh, samples will be sequenced at greater depth. The quality score of the base uh, it should be greater equal to or greater than thirty. Not in any of the case uh, lesser than twenty. Then you can see that uh, once you have the VCF file, these many variants will be there approximately. And once you filter it, uh, they will reduce to this strength. Then the, there will be a one column for the minor allele frequency and it should be lesser than 0 0.01. Then you can see how uh, the variants will be redu reduced. Then the filtration will be put on the coding region. So first we have to look at the coding regions. Uh, whether the coding uh, variants are associated with your disease in the sample or not. Because most of the disease uh, are associated with the coding variants. More than 80% of the disease uh, are associated with the coding variants. So now you have the only few, uh, hundred, few hundreds of the variants and these are easy to analyze further. So uh, if you look at the workflow, the, all the variants, then the quality filter, then the some common filters uh, and then the deleteriousness, whether the, uh, so the functional tools will predict whether it is a pathogenic or non-pathogenic means whether that impact will be high modifier or less. And then the genetic filter, biological filter and the candidate variant. So this is how you have to uh, look at your variants one by one. So you cannot see everything together. One by one, you have to apply these filters. So the goal of this uh, filtration and um, uh, interpretation is the, so what uh, could be the input for that? So the genomic sequences, which will come from the either whole genome, whole exome or the targeted gene, uh, targeted gene panel, either from the proband or from the family. So better, it is better always to perform with the family. And NIPT samples, if I take your example, it's a, it is always a process uh, along with the parental samples. So we should uh, understand the pedigree, how the pedigree is there. Pedigree analysis is also equally important and they affected uh, family members. So those information is very, very important. The disease, the standard ontology is needed. So once we have the disease, some indication of the disease, what we are looking for, then what, uh, what the, the function and the other, uh, uh, there are databases like COMIM, you should uh, go through that uh, with that disease. You can search in the OMIM database and the, uh, you can understand more about the disease. So that uh, why we have to understand this disease. Say suppose if the known genes are not uh, having any variation in your sample, then you, you have to, you can look uh, the other genes. The out, what would be the output? So uh, the output you get from this interpretation and what are the genes or the mutation or the variants which are relevant to the disease. Excuse me, so ma'am. Yes. 
Ma'am, sometimes if our uh, if our mm -hmm. sample is for research purpose, then also non-coding region involved. So, is it possible to identify the non-coding region variation? Yes, but those pipelines are different for the non-coding variant calling. So there are uh, so okay. Uh, let me put in this way. So when once you have the alignment, uh, so uh, if it is a whole exome non-coding variant you cannot call okay because the, you are processing only for the coding region okay. uh then if uh, then you have to go for the whole genome whole uh, from whole genome you can call for the non-coding the pipelines for the variant calling different type of uh variant calling is different so uh you have to decide what is your aim and objective before you process for the sample if your aim is to evaluate both coding and non-coding regions variant, then you have to go for whole genome. Uh, if you want only the coding region, go for the whole exome. If you know the what genes, uh, what disease you are looking, let's say suppose you are looking only for the neurological disorder or cardiac disorders, so then the panels are available for such diseases or disorders or say, because there are some 50, 60 or 100, fewer 100 genes are involved in this. Uh, under different set of phenotypes or the conditions. So you can perform only those genes uh, taking the panel and then analyze it. Uh, but uh, again, if you are doing the whole genome, you can uh, also know the only the coding uh, data analysis, only some genes, but that is not possible from targeted or exome uh, analysis. But at the same time, the cost is also involved. Whole genome cost is more as compared to whole exome and the uh, targeted gene panel. So you have to decide before processing what is your aim and objective, where you would like to go. If it is a clinical purpose, yes, you have to look for definitely for the cost, how much patient can bear. But if it is a research, pro, a research purpose, better to go for whole genome so that you have the data and whatever you want to analyze, you can analyze uh, maybe uh, after some time. So say, suppose you would like to have one disease, very rare disease, where the genes are not mapped, less information is available. So you can go for whole genome. And from whole genome, first you can, uh, so similar phenotypes, you can look for the phenotype gene, uh, gene association, take the gene list, analyze those genes. If they are not there, then you can look for other coding regions. And if you don't find any uh, coding variant, then you can look for a non-coding regions variant. So from the whole same whole genome data, you can call, uh, you can apply a different pipeline for calling the variants, different type of variants. So from that, you can call for uh, uh, SNPs, you can call for um, copy number variation, you can call for indels, you can call for large insertions and deletions. So there are different pipelines you can apply on whole genome data. Okay, I've got it. Yeah, so it is just the uh, summarization of these steps. The first is sequencing, then the mapping, then the BAM file we will get. Uh, and from BAM file, we can call for the variant and different type of variants can be called for from the BAM alignment file. So SNV, structural variants, VCF mal manipulation and merging different VCF files together and look at what variants are. So this, this manipulation and merging will be important um, and uh, crucial when you are analyzing the family samples together uh, and say, suppose if you assume that, yes, in the proband, your variant could be a heterozygous or homozygous. So you can filter uh, the variants based on that information as well. So once we have that, then the annotation, filtration and disease gene association. So for the sequencing, there are different platforms, HiSeq, MySeq, Bio, Iron Torrent, CGI, and all. And there are different modes of sequencing you can do for the whole genome, exome, and RNA seq, and all. So BAM, uh, in, uh, so BAM preparation, uh, the input is the BAM file, output will be the BAM file. So in that, first we have to sort the BAM file when we get the alignment file, mark the duplicates, realignment. So in G GATK pipeline, that is the inbuilt parameters, which will do the local realignment. So that is the um, why people prefer GATK. Otherwise, you have to do manually. You have to use different tools to do that. 
then the uh, uh, then we use compu uh, uh, intensive uh, computational tools for the different part of the pipelines for the uh, variant filtration and interpretation so the for the variant calling the input will be a multiple bam file so you can uh, give multiple bam files and the output will be vcf so then again uh, in the gatk you will you can get the snvs SS, uh, svs browsing the variant calls uh, and all merging the vcf files so you have the multiple vcf files so there are different steps again which you can uh, use uh, uh, so either you can merge the bam files itself from the different samples or you can call the individual vcf files and then merge the vcf files together so preferable uh, to use the vcf uh, call the vcf files individually and then merge them together because what will happen sometimes the data generated from from each and uh, every individual samples will be different so call the vcf different and then merge it uh, mer merge it after vcf so this can be mostly done by vcf tool so it, uh, and then uh, 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 in this uh, merge vcf file the goal would be to visualize the problematic regions for manual validation and design primers for the confirmation. So what will happen? Uh, so once you have the uh, variants, prioritized variants, so sometimes uh, through the literature you can get, yes, these are the variants which are associated with that particular disease, but uh, sometimes the literature availability is not available. Then you have to do the validation. So you can take those regions, you can design the primers and then do the confirmation by other techniques like you can confirm with the Sanger, you can uh, confirm with the uh, PCR itself, or you can do the confirmation with real time PCR. So there are different uh, techniques which you can use for the validation. So for the variant calling or va variant filtration, the first step is the annotation. Uh, and this will give us the relevant variants or the genes which are which could be potentially associated with the uh, di uh, disease. So the filters based on the variant annotation. So first we have to look uh, whether the variants are missense, nonsense, or splice. Because these are the variants. If they are the missense, mis uh, nonsense, or the splice uh, site variations, uh, they will be uh, probably pathogenic because they will alter the transcript and the does the protein. The filters based on the inheritance mm -hmm. patterns. Uh, whether it is a recessive mode or the dominant or the compound heterozygous. So those inheritance patterns we should understand and then filter based on that. So there are different set of uh, filter uh, filtering tools, Gemini, FAM. So there are many things uh, you can use uh, uh, automated one or you can, these filtering can be done using the simple uh, grep command also in Linux or you can uh, use uh, Excel also for the filtering. Uh, whatever uh, uh, is comfort zone, you can use those things. So annotation, so the in input of the VCF file, which will have the genes with the mutation uh, and the output will be the disease, uh, uh, the variants which are relevant to disease and the functional information. So the basic information from the gene cards, adding the pathway from InBeauty and the uh, you can search in the databases of the disease genes, which could be linked. Uh, these are the databases like H HGMD, OMIM, and CleanVar. So these are the three important databases. You need to understand these databases. And if you are using the automated tool or the web server, the data will be fetched basically from these th uh, three databases. All three databases are free of cost? Available? Yes, yes, yes. All are free to use. Uh, just uh, in some databases, you have to use your academic mail ID, but they are free to use. So here, whatever I will show you, it is all free to use. There is no restriction. Uh, you can use uh, anything and uh, you can, on some databases, you can create your account and then use it. So whatever you will be using, it will retain for some time in your account. So until unless you will not delete, it will retain over there. Mm -hmm. So now, uh, apart from these filtration, uh, the, some um, uh, machine learning approaches are also available to correlate the genes with the disease. Because now we understood that every population will have a different set of genes and uh, maybe in one population, 
uh, that variant is common, but in another population, it could be a pathogenic. So people are trying to automate through the machine learning approaches. So these are some uh, computational res um, resources, how you need, uh, what you need um, uh, for different steps. So if you want to do the read mapping, uh, your sample data will be huge and you need this much of disk space for uh, processing one sample. Because if you take um, uh, whole genome data for one individual, it will be around 90 GB. And when you process, different outputs will be generated. And those outputs will also be huge. So you need uh, this much of sample. So BAM preparation. Uh, so after read mapping, usually we get the SAM file. SAM file is very huge. So immediately it is converted to BAM file. And to save the space in your disk, you can delete the SAM file because SAM and BAM can be interconverted together. So these are the some steps and uh, how much uh, time you require and what is the uh, computational resources you require. So gene prioritization. So once we have the variant annotation, the filtration will be performed on different set of parameters. That all we will be looking and then we will connect those variants with the gene disease. So uh, to have so once we have the phenotypes, so what are those phenotypes? So, so in the humans, we all the phenotypes are having this ID and those IDs are known as the HPO terms. So every phenotype, say suppose how you look for the fair color, for the short stature, for the long stature, for your polydactyly, so every every phenotype is being assigned with the one HPO term. So and this database is called as phenomizer. Phenomizer means phenomes, phenomes. So we need to understand how the phenotypes are associated with the genes or the genomics. So to understand, it is very, very important to map each and every phenotype with the genomics. So in the genomics, we will have the DNA sequences, we will have genes, SNPs, variants their expression, their proteins, and uh, the network of different proteins. And in the phenotypes, we will have the, uh, for the eyes, for the skeletal system. So in the eyes also, we will have a different variation, different diseases uh, in the skeletal system also, as I mentioned, the polydactyly, and how these phenotypes are associated with the genomics. And then together, uh, uh, it will be uh, known as the disease omics. So disease omics means when you are doing the association between genes and uh, var genomic variants with the phenotypes and then gives rise to the association. Yes, this particular gene variation involves in this disease. So uh, there are uh, there is a database called Phenomizer, which will have the uh, human phenotype uh, ontology. So there are more than 10,000 terms which describe the human phenotype abnormalities and which are associated with more than 7300 human hereditary syndromes there are 2000 around 2741 genes uh, to create the disease associated genes initially and now this database is also growing uh, day by day there are three independent sub ontologies like mode of inheritance onset and clinical uh, association and the phenotype abnormality so there are some genomic variants which will give you the phenotype abnormality. But there are some genes, uh, gene variants which will not, uh, uh, you cannot see the phenotype change. So that also we need to understand. So this is how it will look as, uh, the, so this is the phenotype. We will look at this particular database uh, in detail because this is very, very important. So how one can uh, take the, uh, genes associated with your uh, variants or the phenotypes. So we need to understand. So these are the databases from where not only the phenomizer, there are other databases how you can fetch this gene association. Wow. Even through in NCBI also, you can take that list. So this is how uh, this uh, database looks like and how you can, so you can see uh, this is the HPID and this is the features. So say, suppose you want for one to two syndactyly or any other feature, uh, there will be a HPO term and you when you will click on this HPO, HPO term, it will give you the disease association and with the gene information, what all known genes are associated with this particular phenotype. 
So the phenotype interaction of exomes, phoenix. So this removes the off-target and synonyms variants. Mm -hmm. It tests the population frequency of other variants. Uh, and there are uh, some known SNPs, uh, which will be scored uh, through the SIFT and the polyphen. SIFT and polyphen are the databases which will give you the functional prediction of your variants, whether it is a pathogenic or non-pathogenic, like which the kind of effect it will show. So this will be for the functional annotation. So the final score will uh, give you the pathogenic score into frequency score, and which will be used for the categorization. Uh, then the clinical relevance we have to see and uh, CleanVar is a database which will give you the clinical relevance of your variant because CleanVar is a database where all the known variants and their association with the disease and their pathogenicity is uh, being deposited in this particular database. So the understanding of these databases are also important. So say, suppose somebody will give you one variant and you can use these databases to evaluate such variants. Even though when you get that your variant, uh, which is not known, uh, having the known association with the disease, you can use these independent databases to evaluate the pathogenicity and functionality of your variant. Excuse me, ma'am. Yes. When we're talking about NIPT sample with... Uh identify BRCA1, BRCA2 mutation, then mm -hmm. this step is not applicable for this purpose, right? Directly we get the results, no? And we can find out whether it is a BRCA1, BRCA2 mutation is there or not. See, that is a known gene, right? Yeah. So sometimes, so there are two conditions. One is known, one is unknown, right? Say, suppose in BRCA1, BRCA2 also, there are some known variants, okay? So, you know, uh, and maybe you, when you are doing with the parental samples, you know what are the genes present in the uh, parents and what, what is present in your proband. So, that is how it works. But say, suppose, uh, th now you take the one condition that where you do not know the parental status, what you will do, right? So, either there, there are again different conditions. First, you can evaluate the, uh, so you, you know what genes you are looking. So, again, there are, you can create so many conditions. You know the genes, you do not know the genes. You know the variants, you do not know the variants. So when we know something, it is very easy to evaluate. When we do not know anything, then what? Right? So it goes like that. So even though if you will uh, use all these known um, um, softwares and these things, these are all integrated together. But everything is not available. So what you will do? Because in research, as much as you will integrate uh, manually, it will be uh, giving you good result. So in clinical settings, now many things are well validated, well uh, well in execute. So you do not need to worry, worry much. But uh, say suppose if you are looking for some rare disease, what you will do? So you should know all these things. And sometimes whatever the known uh, associations are there, that, that is not available, uh, that is not present in your sample with the known disease. Some other variants will be there. So what you will do with those variants? How you will evaluate those variants? So today some maybe thousands of uh, variations are known in TP53 or BRCA1, BRCA2. Maybe you get over the period of time, you will get one sample where any known variant is not there, but variant is there which is not known, what you will do with the, that variant, how you will correlate that variant, yes, this is the culprit of your, that disease. Right? Hello? Yes, got it, ma'am. I got it. Okay. And so, um, even though when you know, you should know the process, what you are doing, right? And what are the different ways that the same thing can be done? So same thing can be done in different ways. But the basis, whether you take your uh, uh, softwares, whether you take CLC, whether you take your uh, uh, iron torrent software, because they provide the software. There is no doubt about it. Kaijin platform, so CLC is from Kaijin. But these, these have the limitation. Those softwares have limitations. First thing, the cost maintenance of the li uh, licenses, then the regular updates, 
how frequently you update your license, right? So how you update your databases. So that depends on this. So some free databases are uh, updated very, very regularly. So you need to be updated. Say suppose today one publication uh, is out with some variants linked to some disease. This, this if you know that, uh, and these free databases will be updated much more faster than the software databases. So these are the things which you have to take care. You need to update your license. You need to update the databases which are integrated in your software. Even though if you, if you want to spend that much of cost on the maintaining of the software. Okay. So same thing, if you take CLC or any other database, uh, software, these all databases will be integrated there. Okay, there is no doubt about it. But there are some other databases which are not public. But when you use these tools, they are also integrated with those databases. So uh, you have to be very tricky. And again, an IPT is only for the clinical. Research is very less. So clinical, as much as you are stringent in clinical, it will be good. All these ACMG guidelines, now they are integrated with CLC. Uh, you are done. You do not need to know. But you, you need to know when it comes to a new variant, which you are, uh, it is not associated, how to categorize that variant. Whether it is on uh, BUS or it is a pathogenic, how you, you are evaluating, whether it is a culprit of your in your sample. So that is very, very important. Yes. Uh, so, uh, for the annotation, the first and the foremost choice, the tool is the VEP, that is the Variant Effect Predictor. So, it is from the ensemble. This database or this tool can be installed in locally and you can use either the web server. So, we will be looking at this particular uh, tool, how you can use this because uh, if you are not using software, what you will do? Yeah, so this is the priority tool which you can use. So you can use either ANOVAR or VP. So VP is used mostly because this is from the ensemble and what reference genome annotation, they are updated very, very frequently and with the uh, all updated information. So what VP will de uh, determine, it will de determine the effect. Uh, it will... Uh, uh, annotate uh, the insertions, deletion, small insertion and deletion. It can annotate your copy number variations or the structural variations on the genes, transcript and protein sequences, as well as the regulatory regions. So what does this mean? This, this is the tool which can annotate any kind of variant. So whether it is a SNP, it is an indel, it is copy number variation or the structural variant. So once you have the variant called file from any other any type of variants, it can annotate. It can provide the information on the location of the variants, whether it is in the upstream of the transcript or the downstream on the transcript, whether it is in the coding region or the non-coding region or in the regulatory region. It can give us the information about the consequences of the variants on the protein sequences like whether it is a stop gain or the miss sense or the stop loss or the frame shift variant. It can also show is the uh, known variants that match with the, our variants and associated with the minor allele frequency from different databases like thousand genome projects, NOMAD or the exact project or different populations. It can also uh, functionally predict the variants from uh, databases like SIFT and Polyfin and it scores the variance for change to protein sequences. So this is the, and it can also provide the uh, experimentally validated uh, genomic features. So uh, I will show you in detail how to use a variant effect predictor. So this is how you can set the parameters and then get the results. So how the, uh, it will show you, it will show you how many variants are being processed, how many variants are filtered out, uh, whether they are the, how many among all these lists, how many are novel, how many are existing variants, and what are the overlapping genes, and it will provide us the visualization as well for the consequences, whether what, how many are stopped gained. So it will consolidate your 
VCF file and provide you the visualization about your variance. So how the information will look like. So you can see the location, the alleles, the consequences and different uh, genes, what is the position uh, and it will fetch the data also from the ensemble itself because this is the ensemble. So NCBI ensemble are integrated together and it will fetch. Also, it is uh, integrated with the population frequency database. It is integrated with the OMIM. It is integrated with CleanVar, uh, SIFT, Polyphane. So there are different databases which it will fetch the data for your variants. So GenCode and the RevSeq, so it will give you. So how the variant severity you can see. So if you look at the gene, so this is the five prime end. This is the three prime end. How these your variants are uh, located uh, in different uh, genomic region. So it is like that. So first will be the regulatory region on the transcription binding sites, then the five prime UTR or the start site. So if the start lost is there, so you can look at this. Because if the start position is itself is lost, then the protein will not be coded. So looking at these different uh, positions of your variants, you can evaluate the variant severity. So which you can which variant you can prioritize and which cannot prioritize. So uh, you can see if the uh, uh, so there are different type of uh, effect which can be produced by your variants. So if uh, so gray color uh, if the variants are present in any of these regions they are the modifiers. If they are the variants which are present in these sites they are the high impact and the uh, variants which are present in the uh, blue zone, then they are the low impact. So missense variants, in-frame in deletion, in-frame insertions, protein altering variants will have the moderate effect. Uh, if the variants are present in the start loss site, stop gain, frame shift, uh, splice donor variant, splice acceptor variant, stop lost, transcription amplification or ablation, they will have the high impact and they will be the cause for your pathogenicity or the disease. They could be the modifier because if any regulatory region or the transcription binding sites uh, have the alteration, they could be modified. Uh, but depending on the uh, analysis, you can suggest that, okay, these are the culprit for variants for the disease. So this, is, uh, this will help us in the prioritization of the variants. So say, suppose if you could see uh, variation in different genes, but these genes are not involved in those phenotypes. So then they cannot be a culprit for that particular variation or the disease production in your sample. So that also you have to take care. So uh, where is it in the exome? So there are different things which you can look at. So in which exome it is, where it is, what regulatory elements are there nearby and the visualization, ultimately the visualization is the key. So looking at this table, you cannot see where it is, in which uh, uh, things are there. So then there are different visualization uh, tools which you can use for the visualization. So the, uh, the main important uh, browser is the UCSC Genome Browser, where you can upload your data and visualize your variant. This also I will show you how you can visualize your variant in UCSC Genome Browser. So once you upload your data in the visualization browser, you can set the tracks. So we have in the, uh, below the visualization window, we have different tracks like mapping and the sequencing, genes and gene predictions, phenotype literature, if you want to visualize along with your variants. Uh, transcript and EST. EST is the expression sequence tab. You want to map with expressions, regulation. You want to look at the comparative genomes with other species, the variations and the repeat regions. You can uh, set your tracks and then uh, visualize along with your variants. So these are the different tracks which are available in UCSC browser, which you can use them. So um, what is the importance why we are doing the variant interpretation? So whether it is a previously published, uh, which is uh, the, the associated with the disease, with the phenotype is pathogenic or not. 
So that is the interest why we are doing the variant interpretation. So whether all the variants observed in a control population are benign or not, because there, there will be some variants uh, in some population, they will be benign or in some population, they could be a pathogen. So that also we need to understand. So what is the evidence uh, to use to ultimately classify a variant? And how do we ensure the consistency among the clinicians, clinical laboratory and researchers? So because what you are saying that, yes, it is a pathogenic, other labs, other clinicians also should report the same thing. And if we thought that uh, the gene may be implicated in a specific disease, that uh, we can screen a cohort of the patients and look for the variants in the respective genes. And if we identify a variant in a patient, which is not fine in the 50 control samples or the 100 alleles, because for each uh, uh, gene, we will have the two alleles. And it could be uh, a pathogenic variant and whether it is a statistically significant or not. So to look all these things, there is a framework which is provided by uh, different um, uh, institutes, so like ACMG and AMP. So these are the, uh, they provided a clinical guidelines for the variant classification. And these variant classification basically for the germline variants. And CAP ensures the quality of the uh, interpretation. So they interpret uh, the variants by scoring into different categories. So whether it is a benign or variant of uh, unknown significance and the pathogenic. So based in the uh, alteration in the sequence, uh, these uh, variations can be categorized into five categories. So here it is just the three because benign, probable benign, pathogenic or the probable pathogenic. So these two other categories are there which comes into that. So the variant which is not, uh, doesn't show uh, to appear have a deleterious effect uh, and often associated with a normal or no human phenotype is categorized into benign category because it is not causing any pathogenic effect or helps in uh, producing a disease. Variants of unknown significance, they could be benign or they could be pathogenic, but uh, the association which is not uh, experimentally validated with the disease risk is unknown. So the, those variants, though they are pathogenic or benign, are classified as the, uh, unknown significance because we do not have the evidence towards those pathogens, pathogenic variants or the benign variants. So they are categorized into VUS. So if we would like to categorize such variants either into benign or pathogenic, we need to experimentally validate it. And the pathogenic variants, the variants which is proven to be deleterious to protein or the gene function and are associated with a particular human phenotype or the disease are categorized into pathogenic category. So as per ACMG classification, uh, so ACMG, AMP together, they have provided a set of standards. They are 28 standard attributes based on different uh, attributes. These are the attributes. So variant type, population databases, computational predictions, from the annotated databases. So con considering all these parameters, there are 28 at, uh, standard attributes are suggested by ACMG AMP, which can classify your variant either as a pathogenic, likely pathogenic, VUS, likely benign or benign. So what are those at, uh, predictions? So there are uh, based, uh, so there are two categories, attribute prediction and the literature evidences. Under attribute predictions, there are 17 attributes and uh, they use uh, variant-based prediction, computational tool prediction, population allele frequency and the database domain-based predictions. So variant uh, type uh, based predictions means that it will classify whether your variant is nonsense, frame shift or the splice site variant. So if the variant is uh, classified as nonsense frame shift and the splice site it is uh, uh, classified as pvs1 that is the pathogenic if the variant is synonyms it is classified as uh, bp7 means this is b9 uh, if it is a missense same amino acid same position ps1 if it is a different amino acid same position pm5 
so these computational tools will predict based on the functions. So if these, these are the three commonly used databases, SIFT, Polyphane, and CAD. But uh, if you cannot see a very great uh, things over here, there are other databases like FAM is there, then the uh, mutation tester is there. There are many other databases you can use individually as well. So if out of three, two shows pathogenic effect, it is assigned as PP3. If uh, two shows benign, then uh, it is assigned as BP4. Based on the population allele frequency, so there are different databases. NOMAD is there, EXAC is there, 1000 genomes are there, Indigene is there. So Indigene is basically for the Indian population. So if the allele frequency is greater than 5%, it is assigned as BA1. So this is in the control population. If uh, the allele frequency is greater than 5%, it, it cannot be a pathogenic. Uh, so if it is uh, between AF1 to 5, uh, it is assigned as BS1. If it is present in the healthy adults, it is BS2. And if the allele frequency is 0 or lesser than 0 0.05, it is assigned as PM2. Then the disease or the domain-based prediction. So whether the variant is present in the important domain, which will have the structure or the function of these proteins, and whether it is altered because of the variations present in these domain will alter the function and structure of those mm -hmm. proteins. If the PFAM, so PFAM is the important database which will predict the domain. So if PFAM predicts the, uh, the variation is present in the important domain, it is classified as PM1. If the index not in the repeat regions, it is classified as PM4. If the indels are in the repeat regions, it is assigned as BP2. If clean were assigned the variant as pathogenic, it is assigned as PP5. And if clean were uh, predicts it as B9, it is assigned as BP6. If the variants are uh, if those are present in the missense, greater than 50% of the pathogenic missense variants in the genes are already reported, it is assigned as BP2. If it is missense plus greater than 50% of the pathogenic protein truncated variants, it is assigned as BP1. So while on the literature-based evidences, there are 11 attributes. So through the functional studies, family segregation data, association studies, and the allelic effect. So you can assign the attributes. So pathogenic in functional studies, PS3. If it is benign in the through the functional studies, it is assigned as BS3. Segregation is observed. So that's why the pedigree analysis is very, very important. The family history. If you observe the segregation, then it is assigned as PP1. If the segregation is not observed, then BS4. If the large family, like uh, more than three generations, if you have the uh, family pedigree uh, and you observe the variant in the large family, it is assigned as PP4. Uh, and if the parental sample on the family, the variant is absent, but in the proband it is present. Uh, so it means that it is it could be de novo. And if that de novo variant is confirmed by any technique like Sanger PCR or whatever the technique you use, and, but it is it should be confirmed and well validated, then it is assigned as PS2. But if it is de novo but not confirmed with other techniques, then is it is assigned as PM6. Through the association studies, if the odds ratio is greater than five, it is assigned as PS4. And if the alternate disease mechanism is known for that particular variant, it is assigned as BP5. And if the variant is present in the compound uh, heterozygous in transposition, that is the in different positions of the chromosome, then it is assigned as PM3. If it is present in the uh, cis position that is on the same chromosome, then it is assigned as BP2. So based on these 11 and 17 attributes and total of eight, uh, 28 attributes, you can classify your uh, variant into these different categories. So we will be looking how to categorize these particular variants into different and assign the different attributes. Also, if your variants falls in the VUS classification uh, and these data is not available, supporting data is not available, then you need to ensure the extended family studies, analysis with families of the similar disease you can consider and uh, the sharing of the genetic variants and phenotypes. Like if uh, any other genetic disease will have the similar kind of phenotypes, you can uh, take those data. 
or you can uh, collaborate with the different research groups, those we, who are working in the similar line and better uh, population scale database could also be used to classify, reclassify your VUS. And also when you are doing all these VUS classification, you have to do extensive follow-up and maybe tomorrow if uh, any variant is falling in benign, tomorrow it could be a pathogenic when the more data will be available or the vice versa. Maybe today you are uh, uh, assigning one uh, variant as a pathogenic, but when more data, more population data will be available, it could fall into benign. So there are multiple possibilities. So follow-ups and reclassification of the variants are also important. So today I will stop here. Tomorrow we will look into practically how uh, we can annotate our VCF file. So we will be taking a use case uh, where we get the VCF file before how we get we got the VCF file. I'll show you those steps as well. And uh, once we get the VCF file, how to annotate and how to filter those variants that all we will be looking at. So I'll stop here. If you have any more questions, uh, please you can ask. Uh, actually, uh, uh, ma'am, uh, very good uh, uh, presentation. I got a uh, lot of uh, understanding. But uh, ma'am, uh, I am very new and beginner of uh, NGS. So uh, what type of preparation I need to do uh, before uh, tomorrow uh, practical session? Because I don't know about uh, any uh, like software and all. Is there any pre-installation of any software I, I need to do? Mm -hmm. Not really, because it can go simultaneously. It's not a very big deal to install some software. Uh, Mostly no, it is uh, web server and databases. Okay, so I have Windows, right? No Linux, is it okay? Yeah, yeah, I'm also using Windows laptop. Okay, ma'am. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Very so, much. may I know your background? Like, what do you do so that uh, maybe I can include some specific things which are more relevant to your field? Yeah, actually, uh, I uh, did a PhD in uh, biochemistry from MS University, Baroda. Uh, currently, I am a section head in uh, molecular pathology department in uh, one of the private uh, diagnosis laboratory. And uh, we we have did uh, uh, three lakhs, more than three lakh samples in COVID. And uh, we are currently doing uh, H1N1 and uh, chikungunya dengue and this kind of uh, clinical diagnosis. Currently, now in future, we will plan to establish the NGS platform to identify uh, uh, like uh, NIPT samples diagnosis. That's why we we have already purchasing process like uh, iron torrent uh, platform. Mm -hmm. Okay. So our main target like NIPT samples some um, uh, uh, so, uh, so ma'am, is there any uh, mandatory to take the permission from NBR like in COVID, uh, COVID testing as a, a very stringent criteria like ICMR and uh, uh, this NBR approval? So for NGS, uh, for clinical diagnosis, is there uh, mandatory to take the NBR in this uh, uh, so can... Yes, it is required. You yes. might be having already NABL for your COVID, right? COVID, yes. We have... uh, so you can include this parameter in your scope. Scope, only in scope. Okay. So you can extend your exp scope at any time. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, all right, we will uh, meet tomorrow. Uh, can we have the from 6.30? Is it possible from your end? No, uh, no problem. 6.30. No yeah. Okay. So tomorrow we will, tomorrow and day after we will start from 6.30. Okay. Yeah. Same link will work, but I will start at 6.30. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much.